Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our distinguished uh, visitor lecture for today. Uh, I'm actually pinch hitting for Professor McPherson, who was just uh, teaching this morning, and uh, um, I had the pleasure of picking up our guest from her hotel this morning, and I, I want to introduce her to you. Uh, we are delighted to have uh, Professor Allison Christians here at the Faculty of Law. She is the H. Heward Steichman Chair in Tax Law at uh, McGill University. Before that, she was at the University of Wisconsin and Northwestern uh, University. Uh, and before joining um, academia, she was uh, a lawyer at, in a New York law firm. I won't remember the name of it, but um, practicing uh, tax law and uh, is her interests are in, uh, as you know from the title of her talk, Human Rights and Tax Law, which um, I think she's going to be drawing some interesting connections for us, because I don't think everybody often thinks of those two things um, in a connected way. And um, Professor uh, Christians is particularly interested in issues of international uh, uh, economic justice, globalization, as well as domestic uh, tax law and policy and the implications of that for human rights. So I'm not going to take any more time and I'll turn it over to her for uh, her lecture today. So please join me in welcoming the presentation. Okay, so make sure you can hear me. Can you? You're okay in the back? Yeah. Alright. Well it's really just a tremendous pleasure to be here. This is my first trip to Winnipeg let alone the University of Manitoba. And it's very gray and dirty, but so is Montreal. <laughs> so I overlooked that. And I went for a little walk on beside the river, I guess, where I met this forks. In at the forks, beautiful, beautiful, amazing, uh, with this sculpture of a building that is proclaiming that there's something important about human rights. So important that a whole neighborhood is arranged around this uh, testament to the central place of human rights in our lives. So I was thrilled. Thank you. Thank you for putting me in this hotel. And that is the image. I, but I had to go to the, uh, to the nearest pharmacy because I forgot my contact lens solution. This is part of the video that you have to cut off because it doesn't. <laughs> so I had to actually walk over to the other side and around and it was dark and it was kind of cold and there were some strange looking people on the path. I was completely fine. It was totally safe and everything was great. I got to the other side and saw kind of the city laid out in front of me and thought, you know, there's an enclave going on here in this little tiny neighborhood you put me in or there's something special. It's very dynamic happening around that museum. So I was really energized by it. But I haven't actually gone into the museum yet. I'll do that tomorrow. I'll spend the day there tomorrow. So tomorrow I'll know something about human rights. <laughs> Today I don't know anything about human rights. I just know about tax. <laughs> so I'm going to share a little story with you, though, that I think I, you'll see why I'm asking some questions about taxation, human rights. What's the connection? Okay. So some of this story is going to feel very familiar to you, and you'll know it. You'll be like, yeah, I don't recognize that. And then there'll be a point in my presentation when I just lose you and you go, no, I don't know what you're talking about anymore. <laughs> that point where we get lost, what are you talking about? That is exactly where I am lost too. And that's the work I'm trying to unravel. This is what this is sort of the thinking that I'm doing. And you'll see exactly where I am in the process. So what you're getting here is not a polished presentation of a well thought out thesis. What you're getting here is a frontier of confusion, disarray, and questions. And I hope you'll help me and indulge me as I walk you through it. All right. So every politician everywhere has two things they want to sell you. You know what they are? Do you know what they are? Well, they're jobs and growth. Disagree? You all agree with me. Yes, you've all heard every politician ever in the history of mankind talk about jobs and growth. We need jobs, we need growth. You know that guy. <laughs> He has a low tax plan for jobs and growth through training, trade, and low taxes. You know that guy. Our top priority has to be jobs and growth. Here's uh, Markel at Davos. We need a growth-oriented, sound fiscal policy. We need investments. We need jobs. And Markel, not content to just get any jobs or any investment. No, these jobs have to be created in those areas which promise long-term highly qualified employment. It's a very specific kind of job she, she wants. Tony Abbott from Australia says, jobs and growth are and not climate, 
very specifically not climate, are the top of the G20 agenda, lest you forget. George Osborne tweeted that the Eurozone has to have a better plan for jobs and growth. Chinese President Xi Jinping says China's success has depended on policies to maintain growth and provide job opportunities. And in South Africa, Jacob Zuma said that they're looking to economic partnership with China in the pursuit of, economic, uh, of uh, inclusive growth and job creation. Okay, there's only so many jobs. <laughs> Now growth, we, we, maybe, we have theories that maybe growth is not zero sum. That is, we can all grow together, we all pull together, rising tide, boats, and all that stuff. But there's only so many jobs, so if you and Winnipeg put together a nice tax package and get Ubisoft here, the people that live next to me in Montreal will not have jobs, and the people that live next to you in Winnipeg will have jobs. So you understand this is a comp competition. When we're talking about jobs and growth, we're saying even if it comes at the expense of you, even if it comes at the expense of the climate, even if it comes at the expense of future generations, we mean the politician, I need to get reelected right now, and the way I'm going to get reelected is to make sure that people are fed and happy and consuming products at a regular basis, jobs and growth. We need jobs and we need growth. So if you've been paying attention to the news the, the past few years, you might have seen things that look like this. A lot of protesting, a lot of discussion, a steady lose diet that tells you, it suggests to you, that in the race for jobs and growth, states, governments, have been giving away the store. They've been giving away the store by giving tax breaks to big companies. And the bigger the company and the more employees that company has, the more likely they've got massive job, uh, sorry, tax incentives to come to your place to give your people jobs. Okay? And so what we see in taxation is this cumulative effect where we've been given away the store, and that was sort of okay for a while, for reasons we'll talk about, and then crisis fiscal crisis that spread around the world, and then all of a sudden, all these governments didn't have any money. And what did they do? They started cutting services that people in welfare states like Canada had come to expect, instituting austerity. Okay, so protesting in the street for the first time, I think, uh, in a long time, if not ever, about not just tax, but about international tax. A very specific focus on big multinational corporations getting away with something. We're giving away the store. What is happening? And here we are seeing a recasting of the state in this role. Hey, you guys are supposed to go out there and stop this tax dodging. But this isn't easy because remember that first slide is about jobs and growth. And it turns out if you want jobs, then you've got to have employers. And if you want employers, you're going to have to lure them in. And if you want to lure them in, usually this is how you do it. Money is how you do it. There are different ways to lure them in. You might be familiar with them. For example, you can lure people in by saying, you can abuse all my workers in my country. Just, you know, just pay them cents an hour and just dump all that toxic stuff in the river. You can do that. And people do, uh, politicians do do that, as you well know. But it, there's this other area where you can say, not only can you come and exploit our labor, not only can you come and just dump whatever you want in the water, but we'll pay you for the privilege by building this you know, industrial park and a nice transportation. The lights on everybody else might go off, but yours are going to stay on. Right? And we do that because if I don't do that, the next guy might do that. All right, so we have kind of a strange thing happening. Your politicians need to promote jobs and growth. They've got to get companies in. They've got to get lure in the multinationals. But to do that, they've been giving away the revenue stream that you need to build a society, the infrastructure, that makes it possible to employ people who are going to produce whatever it is that these companies need to produce. Catch-22 or triple bind or a nice vice, however you like to picture that. All right, so along comes in the late 2009, 2010 or so, right after fiscal crisis, along comes a group of people who start saying, hey, wait a minute, this is not 
what we signed up for. Cutting services in austerity, in a welfare state, in a time of crisis is not what we signed up for. We're supposed to be protected. And so you see a rise of NGOs and grassroots groups and coalitions, loose coalitions, of various, you know, kind of rights oriented or just mostly upset people whose lives have changed uh, or who see the lives of people around them changing. And they come out and they start, and they are rights and cause focused. And they start connecting tax avoidance, tax dodging by multinationals, to the erosion of the welfare state. So uh, there's a, a myriad examples, and I invite you to read, you know, all kinds of stuff I've written on this that's kind of not that particularly, you know, mind blowing, but at least tells you what the sort of what the efforts are. But one of them was with Starbucks. So you'll recognize this logo, uh, which looks a lot like the coffee I drank this morning, uh, but isn't quite exactly. So refuge from the cuts. And here's the campaign. It says it's time for the government to wake up and smell the coffee. Women have had enough of being attacked by a cabinet of millionaires. There's a refuge from the cuts. Join us to transform the tax dodger Starbucks into services women depend on, such as refuges and creches. Wasn't it the government that was supposed to offer those, provide those services? What is it to do with Starbucks when those things get cut? So that was that action was in 2012, and they're still at it. This is the Global North version of the cost of tax dodging. Hey, you're cutting women's services. We've been accustomed to taking care of people in our society, and you're cutting those things. This is new for us in developed countries. In the Global South, it's slightly different picture. So here's where we have just a little technical glitch, which is that my videos aren't quite in the slide, so we'll just pull them up beside. Here we go. And let's see if the volume works. This is a test. Zambia Sugar generated profits of $123 million since 2007, but paid less than half a percent in corporate tax. The report estimated that Zambian public services lost $27 million as a result of the tax avoidance, enough to put 48,000 children through school. So did you hear the three little words that every sociologist, every scientist wants to talk about in that clip? as, well there's more, as a result of. That is making a causal connection. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> making a causal connection between what Zambia Sugar did or didn't do in terms of paying taxes and whether you can or won't be able to educate children. In this case, I think he said 48,000? Yeah. Is that right? 48,000 children. Uh, it must be the, there's a causal connection that's being made there. Okay, so can we go back to this? Okay, let's try. Okay. Do you know who that guy is? You don't know who that guy is? Oh, I left it in my, I had my one prop that I forgot to bring. I told you I wasn't gonna bring it for a reason. Oh yeah. At this moment in the presentation, I have now pulled my iPhone out of my pocket. <laughs> Do you have an iPhone in your pocket? Do you have a tablet or, a, you know, some of you have, in fact, I see a few apples. So who here does not own an electronic device? <laughs> you do not own a single, <laughs> you have just <laughs> aged <laughs> yourself. I'm just going to do just a lot of research. I don't do anything personal. Oh, you're just going to take no responsibility for that because you use somebody else's <laughs> <laughs> I see where you're going with that, but I won't let you have it. Forget it. That you have and use an electronic device. I'm a privacy. Ah, well, good luck with that. <laughs> this is Tim Cook. Now, if you have a device, you own, he owns you. Even if you don't have an Apple device, he owns you because he revolutionized, I mean, Apple, not he, his predecessor, revolutionized the personal computer, right? And I'll tell you what Tim Cook says about the connection between tax avoidance and the things we think we need to educate children or have women's, women's refuges. We pay all the taxes we owe every single dollar. 
That's what Tim Cook says, and he says it, as does the CEO of Google, as does the CEO of GE, Starbucks, and so on and so on. They all say the same thing. We pay exactly what we owe, not a dollar less. We are fully compliant in all the jurisdictions in which we do business. Why are you pointing a finger at us? We are doing what we are asked and told to do. In uh, an article in a couple years ago, John Sununu was the uh, former senator and the son of Bush's chief of staff, considered to have engineered Bush's, I don't know if you remember George Bush's, the first one, uh, his midterm aban uh, abandonment of a campaign pledge. Do you remember the pledge? This is, this is going back, like you have to be pretty old to remember this. <laughs> Read my lips. No new taxes. John Sununu's dad, apparently our architect of the backpedaling on that, because it turns out you need taxes to run the state. <laughs> <laughs> and John Sununu's uh, son wrote a column saying, well, oops, sorry, I got out there already. Congress wrote the tax laws. Why would you blame the CEO for obeying them? And so there's a very clear denial of the causal claim, right? So it's just, your, it's an evidentiary claim. Hey, you're saying our tax dodging means no services, well, there's no causal claim there because we are doing what you told us to do. Well, maybe there's a causal claim, but certainly not our fault if it's, if it's violated or if that's, how, if that's real. Or you can't pin it on us, but maybe you could. But we're not, well, it's not our fault if, you, if we did do that. And what Apple and GE and Google and Starbucks and Amazon and so on and so on never tell you, they never tell you how much they spent to make sure those laws say what they say, and they kind of gave it away by accidentally <laughs> advancing the slide, but you are so fast when you read it, that's the problem with PowerPoint, it gets out of control, it gets ahead of you in your presentation if you accidentally go too far. You already know the punchline. The punchline is, that's just one company, and that's a relatively small amount of money, and that's direct, direct lobbying. That's not talking about all the other efforts that Apple makes to subtly influence uh, to work with a consortium of groups to influence the direction of, of uh, political uh, outcomes. And that's only in the United States. What are they spending behind the scenes the rest of the world? And just so you know, if you're worried about Apple, we you know it's razor thin profit margins. I mean, come on, they can't be making that much money. They can't have that much money. Well, right now, right now, Apple's sitting on cash cash, which is to say that Apple's sitting on ca cash equivalent investments, probably U.S. T treasury bills, U.S. dollars, uh, euro bonds, and they're offshore, which is to say they're not in the United States, they're not, in, not being pr used productively, they're not being reinvested in capital investments, they're certainly not being used to pay salaries of people uh, in, in factories. They're sitting there because of an oddity in the U.S. tax rule, which is their tax home. We can come back to that oddity, and I actually think that oddity is a big explanation for the world that we live in now. But for now, it will just suffice to note that if we're talking about the connection between whether a company is taxed and whether the company pays tax, on the one hand, and whether we have a functioning society that takes care of people and provides basic services and fulfills arguably human rights, that question is not answered if you don't look at all of the aspects that make this reality happen. Not just that there's a law, and not just that there's a dispersal of blame for that law, and not just that political influence is a difficulty, but also an economic structure that we have built, which is a global economic structure, which is really difficult to understand unless you dig into the details and read a few tax codes. Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> now, arguably, one of the reasons that Apple pays very little tax anywhere in the world, and Starbucks pays very little tax anywhere in the world, and the same for Amazon and so on, is a little thing we call transfer pricing. Now, transfer pricing is not a bad thing. It's not a negative thing. Transfer pricing is what a company does when it decides which of two entities, which are fictional, which one paid for what. So in Apple's case, you have Apple headquarters in Menlo Park, California, and you have uh, Foxconn somewhere in China, 
as you know. And Foxconn is not Apple, but there's a somewhere a payment between these two companies. And there's a choice about what it costs, what you book. Now, when the companies are connected, that is their multinational group, the decision about what price to put on something for economic purposes is just make it up, what do you want, you know, magic. Because it's a group. So all the money flows to the same place eventually. It's all controlled by the same CEO. So it doesn't matter if you have a subsidiary in the Bahamas and in the Cayman Islands and in Switzerland and you have a headquarters in the US and you have a, uh, an office in Canada and a subsidiary in the Netherlands. It doesn't matter which of those entities paid for the workers to build the, the iPad uh, in China. It doesn't matter for the group. But it matters a lot for the regulatory state because we assign who paid what and what you do is this, you put the costs in the countries where they're going to tax you, and you put the profits in the countries that they're not going to tax you. So you know where the profits are, they're in the Bahamas, Barbados, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Cayman Islands, Cook Islands, to some extent, etc. And where are all the losses? U.S., Canada, Europe. Australia. Okay, this is technical, so we'll just let a businessman explain. <laughs> He'll make us feel much better about it. Let's see if I can find this uh, this clip. Well, I think what uh, a lot of those companies would say, including Associated British Foods, is that they're actually going in for tax planning. They have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to maximize their profits. And in that process, they're wanting to minimize their tax bill. And I remember as a student at the London School of Economics reading Stuart Holland's books in the 1970s about transfer pricing. And some people, particularly NGOs, get very uptight about companies' multinational tax planning. But I think it's the way of the world. OK, I wish I could freeze his, his look when he says, <laughs> I think it's the way of the world, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's something like this. I can't see what you're talking about. What's the problem? This is what everybody does. Okay, again, a scientist or someone who cared about method or thought about empirical you know, data as something that was real and not something that you marshal up whenever it's convenient and just ignore whatever disagrees with you, would say, you have made a promise, you made a first promise, that the corporation's duty is to maximize profits. And from that, nothing else matters. That's what we do. We have to minimize taxes because taxes are a cost, and our duty is to maximize profits. So if you have a cost and tax is a cost, then your duty is to minimize the cost. So we are going to run a truck through every tax code in every country in the world and help write the laws in places like the Cayman Islands. We're going to send teams of people, accountants and lawyers, to tell them how to fix their law so they can lure in all the US and UK and European multinationals. This is going to be an industry because we're all doing this in the service of an obligation. We have a fiduciary obligation. Now, those of you who do human rights, Law, I'm sure can come up easily. Just you know, if we just sat here, we easily come up with a list of reasons why that's such a facile argument that we should be offended that someone could actually even make that argument today. Of course, you're you can't possibly be serious about that. But of course, it's the way of the world is absolutely an empirical statement about the acceptance, the cultural acceptance we have for these, what's well, mysterious, this trash pricing. I'm sure half of you zoned out when I was explaining about the subsidiaries and the price of that. You know, okay, so eventually she'll go back to something I can understand. Here we are, something you can understand. Nobody wants to hear that stuff. And they certainly don't want to study it. And so the uh, inmates are running the asylum, my friends. The attorneys and the accountants are writing all the rules and they're writing them in ways so that you actually can't even see the benefits that are being given away in your tax system. You don't even know they're there. You wouldn't recognize them if I put them right in front of you and said, read this provision, 95-2. Read it and weep. <laughs> you will weep. 
complete because you will read it, it will become incomprehensible, and you will need a degree and seven attorneys affirming you to understand what it says. But what it says is, well, we just give away the store. We're not really to mind too much about that. We're trying to do business here. Jobs and growth. All right. It's the way in the world. So you could look at this and say, and I'm coming around to the human rights, I know you've been very patient and I am getting there. You could look at this and say, this is just a governance failure. It's actually a very standard, classical, what we call a political malfunction. And that is that people want a welfare state. The people. You know, if you polled them and said, would you like to educate the children of Winnipeg uh, so that in the future they can have prospects? You would say yes. Uh, most people would say yes, right? But because there's tax avoidance, we don't have enough money. And when crisis hits, when you take reduced revenues and fiscal crisis, you get to austerity, what we're going to do is cut the education budget again, folks. We don't have enough money for that expensive research thing, whatever it is you're doing at the University of Manitoba. That's just, you just get in there and, you know, deliver the service and forget all that research you're doing. That's just a waste of money and time. We're trying to, you know, we certainly can't make that a public good. That's not a public good anymore. You have austerity. And what happens with austerity is the death of the welfare state in the long run, and sometimes in the very short run. We've seen it in a few places in the very short run. Right? And so, you can say this is just a governance failure. The people want a welfare state. They have to be forced to pay their share because it's unpleasant for each one. But if you say to them, look, you know, I know it hurts to pay your taxes, but in the long run, you know, and all together and collective and, you know, unity and solidarity, we're going to have a good society that we all recognize as something that we value together. Uh, if that conversation doesn't happen uh, politically, or you can't have that conversation because the only conversation you can have is jobs and growth and cutting taxes to get jobs and growth, the only conversation you can have is about the immediate near-term emergency crisis that we're having, then you die. The welfare state dies. That's what's happening. Wake up! This is happening to you here. Right? So, well, we're not suffering, though, are we? I mean, we're in the global north. We are rich. We are consuming well more than we need to, probably. We are comfortable. We are not in the streets rioting. We are not. Things are okay so far. But in the UK, they're looking at the closure, they're looking at the privatization of the health system, the closure of women's refuges, maternal health services being slashed, benefits for people on unemployment who've been thrown in the street because of fiscal crisis, benefits being cut. You know, these are these are hard times. So in the UK and in Europe more broadly, you see activists saying, hey, we had something and you, you took it away. And their response first is just to blame, right? You know this sort of name and shame, very common. It's a good political strategy to kind of bring awareness to a topic. Nothing wrong with name and shame. Uh, and what they're, and the next step of that, which I think we're on right now, is demanding a say in the places where decisions are made. And it turns out the decisions are sometimes made in Ottawa, but they're just as often made in Paris. Why Paris? Because that's where the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development sits. And we send our finance minister over there to compare notes with the finance ministers of other countries and then come back with an action plan. You can read it in the budget. And the answer, I think, today, right now, where we are, from government is, look, we're in a competition. Remember jobs and growth? Jobs and growth. I cannot stress it enough. Jobs and growth. If we don't get those jobs, we die as a society. So we have to give up everything to get them. Never mind that that also gets me elected. That's just a nice, you know, secondary effect. But we have to compete for capital. We have to compete for investment. And you cannot tax it. If you want investment in here, if you want to build a, I was going to say pipeline. <laughs> If you want to drill for the minerals that go into that phone in your pocket, you need capital investment. And if you want capital investment and you want your people to have those jobs and not the ones in the next country over that has the same stuff you have, 
in their ground waiting to be exploited. If you won't give away the store, they will, and you won't get the jobs, and your stuff won't be pulled out of the ground, and you won't get the money from it, and your welfare state will die. Because you won't have a middle class to support it anymore. Okay. You could look at it this way. You say this is a complicated political dance which involves some selfish self-interest combining with a political rhetoric that gets us to a bad place. How do I then get from that to human rights? Well, okay, and this, this is the part where I lose everybody because this is where I don't know the answers and I'm looking at, okay. You can look at this rights framework, right? So political, economic, and social, uh, and cultural rights. And you can say, okay, well, we've got a causal link problem. That same one we talked about before, the company isn't paying and the education is being slashed. So we don't have enough money to pay for education. So the fact that we can't provide basic human rights like in Zambia or maybe in Canada, I don't know how far we have to go to that, to get to that. The fact that we don't have it, it's Apple's fault. It's Google's fault. They're the cops. This is very difficult. It's obviously not Apple's fault or Google's fault exclusively. It's a complicated dance where everybody's involved together. So there's a, there's a causal link problem. And we'll come to what I think human rights activists are trying to do about that problem. And then there's the citizen-state relationship problem, which I haven't fully figured out yet what to do about this. But it seems that the causal link problem here is legal or structural. That is. The people in Zambia who, who's, uh, the, co the corporation is paying a half a percent uh, in tax, the people that are working there, they could argue with the Zambian government, but it's actually not the Zambian government's fault. It's the OECD that has set up a global economic structure and this soft law network of norms that's, that inform how policymakers are going to set up their tax systems, which the United States is probably spearheading, which sends a rush of capital out to the world looking for zero and better tax rates, and they get it. So we have a problem. There's sort of a, it's a complicated problem, like, who, well, who can we blame? I, if I'm going to blame the Zambian government, they're only one actor. We might bring them back up to that empirical problem of whose fault is it that we don't have what we need. So, all right. And I keep telling you activists, because this is what we have. We don't have, we don't have too many lawyers doing this yet. We're talking about, like, street level. We're talking about... You know, Oxfam, we're talking about people who are, who are looking at the problem and saying, how do we you know, rhetorically define this problem? And they say, now we need to build a factual record with reports. We're going to sway the public. That's what they're doing now. Starbucks efforts in the street, street protests. And then, nascent or emerging, we're going to build a causal case in law. Let's go find a case. Now, I've got a couple of slides here. I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to kind of just show you them quickly. But if you want to challenge things, this doesn't really look very hopeful so far. So if you look at the Starbucks protests, the complainants are NGOs and activists, and they're complaining against Starbucks Europe. Notice not, not Starbucks US. They're very specific. The, this, Europe, this Starbucks in the UK, right? And the issue is Starbucks, you didn't pay your tax, and their approach was pure name and shame. It just said name and shame. And you know what happened? Starbucks saw that as a reputational risk, and it came out, and the, and the CEO of the European operations said, all right, notwithstanding what the actual law requires us, we're just going to give you 20 million pounds over the next two years. Now, can you just go back to buying Starbucks coffee again and stop boycotting <laughs> us and having protests? 20 million pounds in Starbucks money is, what, half an hour of operations or so? So it's like a little pinch, but it's not. It's also not a tax, is it, really? Is it a tax if you can just decide that you're going to pay it, but then later you go in, did anybody check to make sure they paid? I mean, how do you even know that they did this thing that they said they were going to do? There's zero accountability for this. So that's a name and shame is maybe it got some small result. It's really kind of not getting too far. All right, so there's Mopani. That's a mine in Zambia. And it's owned by Glencore in Switzerland. And here, some NGOs got together and they made a complaint against the Canadian and Swiss parent companies of that local mining company. And they said, they charged them with aggressive tax points. Well, can you do that? Like, how do you charge somebody with aggressive tax points? Well, it turns out there was this sort of 
odd complaint procedure that the OECD had written into a soft law, Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises, document, which said you can go and lodge a complaint. Well, I gotta tell you, don't get too excited. There were a bunch of cases like this, and they all ended the same way, agree to disagree. That is, the NGOs came, went to the OECD, mounted a big complaint, put together a whole bunch of documents, wrote all kinds of stuff. The OECD asked the company, hey, are you guys dodging taxes? And they said, no. Who? Us? Okay, agree to disagree. That's it. You can't get any further, or at least so far, you can't get any further on this. All right, now, this next one has, is a little off the beaten path, but you'll see a ratcheting up a little bit from name and shame and soft law, yeah, I don't know, tribunal or soft law review to an established uh, forum of some sort. So that's the American flag stomping all over the Canadian one in case it's not obvious from the some of you will only know about this dispute, or even be aware that there could be a dispute, because you're studying a little law called FATCA. Anybody in the audience that doesn't know what FATCA is, be happy, but check to see if you're American. <laughs> and if you are, then you're not happy. The complaints in this challenge are Canadian, what we call border babies. You know what that is? Somebody born in the US, and then immediately brought back to Canada and raised and lived their whole lives in Canada. And the complaint is against the United States. And what is the claim? That the United States is saying, we get to tax our diaspora forever on their worldwide income, even if they never earned a dollar in the United States, even if they never spent any time here. If you were born in the US or you were born of someone who was American when you were born, you are American and you have to pay the tax man. And the approach here is the Human Rights Council. In fact, a grassroots group of mainly Canadian border babies has lodged a complaint at the Human Rights Council saying, you can't tax us on the basis of our nationality. That is nationality discrimination. Now, that's obviously covered by some human rights convention somewhere. It's just got to be, right? So I hear it's going to take six to seven years to even get an acknowledgment from the Human Rights Council that they have received your request. So this group is waiting. That is pending. I suspect that will go absolutely nowhere. That will go nowhere because we're talking about the U.S. now. Okay. So then this last one is not tax, but in fact, I think it's the most intriguing one. I'll tell you what I've seen. This is Guatemala. The complainant is the United States. Oh man, they like to complain in these in these free trade agreements they make, don't they? It's against Guatemala. And the claim is what I'm calling labor standard dumping. Oh, I'm sorry, I wrote that in the American without the U. I'll fix that next time. Labor with a U. <laughs> stand, uh, standard dumping. And uh, it's just, I'm just a term that I try to get it on the slide in as few words as possible. But the idea is Guatemala, if you do not have better labor standards, then you're altering the market for labor between Guatemala and the United States, which means jobs and growth in the United States are going to Guatemala. So, and it turns out we've got an actual hard law instrument finally. It's not a human rights issue, it's not a human rights, but the labor standards is a human rights issue. And so we're going to get at it under this uh, Central American Free Trade Act. And the outcome is pending on that, but here's an interesting thing. If the U.S. can use a free trade agreement to say Guatemala has to raise its labor standards, why can't Zambia use a WTO, for example, to say that the U.S. and its system of pushing capital out through its tax code is doing the same thing to the Mopani copper mine in Zambia? Complicated argument? Yeah, I'm going to go to the museum tomorrow and see if I can figure out a way to put that together. <laughs> it's a really complicated argument. In fact, I'm going to Zambia next week to get together with a team of people who are going to think about this. How do you think about this? How do you put together a thing like that? All right, so I had a couple more slides, but I'm going to stop there because I know you have some questions. And I just want to go to the last slide. In order to do that, I've got to go down like this. There we go. Giving it, giving it away a little bit. But so you can look at it and say, OK, so far, the connection between taxation and human rights 
it's just protest, just that general feeling that people have rights and things aren't going well in our societies and we ought to fix it. There ought to be a law, that kind of general level of, of approach and its name and shame and it's kind of cast around for some way to talk about this problem. But you can also see that, you know, law is not in fact free. It's very, very expensive to get anywhere. Even if the law is on your side, even if you have rights that should ought to be protected, to actually get to a place where you get somebody to recognize them and give you something is a massive challenge. It is a legal challenge. And you have to work with existing documents and press at the boundaries uh, at the same time and try to uh, figure out where how to get in. So in this presentation, I think all I've done here is say, well, we're seeing harms, we're seeing governance problems, we're seeing possible violations of various groups' human rights, but there's no concerted action to kind of understand this, to contextualize this, to put this in legal framework that we can work with. I think that's coming. So in the next couple of years, maybe we'll see some failures that give up parameters of what the, of what the litigation strategy might look like, and then maybe, uh, I don't know, 10, 20, 50 years. Somebody will win something, and then we'll say, remember that all started back in, you know, when Christians was talking about taxation and human rights. That's it. Thank you very much. We have time for some questions. Who wants to start us off? I missed the second to last example, uh, the border babies example. Can you just, I, I didn't I quite get there. what, I get the um, labor uh, dumping, you know, labor centers dumping one. I don't quite get what's yeah. happening here. So, to be honest, this is not a perfect fit, but it's a place where tax is being cast as a human right in the sense right. that okay. you do not have a right to me, to my resources the United States, just because you claim me as a citizen. So it is a complicated uh, relationship, right? Like, who ought to tax you? Uh, think about it, where you were born, or where your parents were born. Canada, United States, nation of immigrants. So if we all think, where were we born? Have you ever checked to see if that country, or the country of your parents' birth, taxes you, claims you as a citizen. And because it claims you as a citizen, says you owe us, you have to pay. We own you, you're our subject. So the United States is the only country in the world that does this well. There's one other country that tries, it's called Eritrea. Eritrea's ambassador or diplomatic official in Canada was kicked out for trying to collect its diaspora tax, but a couple years ago, the United States, in its attempt to catch its diaspora, was welcomed with open arms, and we have in Canada now an agreement with the United States to round up everyone in Canada who is a U.S. person as they define it, and hand them over to be taxed. So the complainants say, you can't claim me. So it's a, in human rights, uh, terms, it's a question that touches on nationality discrimination, maybe, or what? What's the It's not really clear. But what's the connection with these other regimes is that it's a group of people who, through their tax relationship, feel they are being their rights are being violated. So this is a t this is a very messy kind of a problem. And it's a messy problem for us because we've got the most of these hidden Americans. Like probably a million. Are there any? Don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. I don't want to know and I'll tell you why I don't want to know. Because this presentation is not about FATCA. And if it was, we'd have to start over at 12 and we would still be here two hours from now and you would be getting some personal legal advice from me because you'd be so freaked out about what's going on. Okay. So we don't want to have that. We don't want to go there. Um, but the, the human rights complaint is a question of well, who, do I, who gets to claim me as a tax subject? And in all the other contexts, 
claiming the corporation as a tax subject is exactly the problem. The Cayman Islands claims you as a, corp as a tax resident, then the U.S. can't tax you. But somehow they can chase their citizen to the Cayman Islands. If the citizen is sitting in the Cayman Islands, a human is sitting in the Cayman Islands, the U.S. would come and say, you belong to us and you must pay and you will fill out forms and if you don't, you're in big trouble. But if the corporation is set up in the Cayman Islands, the U.S. respects that fiction and says, okay, then all the problems are in the Cayman Islands. It's not ours to tax. That's the, yeah, it's, it's sort of a technical yeah, no, help, thank you. It's a difficult. But I have to admit, I slid, I slid that in there because it's interesting, but I haven't figured out. I have not fully figured out how those work together or if they work together. Maybe they're just two completely different ideas about the connection between tax and human rights. But if you talk to somebody in Canada who was a border baker who was, who was facing this problem, they absolutely see this as a human rights problem. Absolutely in every possible way a human rights problem. And moreover, they point to the non-taxation of the multinational as a gross offense given this connection, this attempt to tax the, the, the human. I don't know. More to be done. Definitely more to be done on that. Hi, sorry. I, uh, I missed the beginning of your, uh, of your presentation, so I apologize. I walked into the transfer pricing ah. section, and I, I'm just not sure it's the Wild West you say it is. I mean, there are restrictions in terms of ta transfer yeah, pricing. Yeah, no, there no, I don't. <laughs> Not at all. I, mean, I guess we'll have to discuss. No, that. I'm going to disagree. <laughs> but I, I mean, for I, yeah. and also, um, how does your thesis fit with Gar? With Gar, yeah. Uh, so there's another strand of literature talking about avoidance. Uh, what is the place of avoidance in a legal system? That is, every legal regime you have, and you learn, and all for all the students, all law school is about teaching you about how legal regimes are about trying to control behavior, and then most of them are about, well, what do we do with all those people that just won't be controlled? What are we going to do with that, right? What, what, what are the, how are we going to monitor? How severely? How, how much are we going to let people get away with things? And so if the speed limit on the street is 60 K M slash H, how fast do you all go? 60? 100? Like how far? 10 clicks over? 20? What's the right? It's a cultural question, and there's a lot of discussion in law about how you ought to think about that problem. So GAR is a speed limit which is not posted. That is, it's not 60, and it's not 100, but what is it? And GAR is an attempt to say, well, look, we can't define it in law. It's just too hard. We just don't know what the right speed is. So we're not going to define it in law, we'll leave it to judges to decide if you've gone too far. And when it comes to taking people's money, that is, that's a tough regime to... And you, well, you can see the Supreme Court is very, very reluctant, mostly reluctant, to, uh, to, to do it. So you take treasure pricing. So, uh, sorry, I should define GAR, right? Do you know what GAR is? General Anti-Avoidance Regime. So basically you say, okay, here's a rule, treasure pricing. Go find a bunch of comparables, market prices, and then tell me why your price deviates from that price, and make a nice memo contemporaneously, and then pick the price that's most beneficial to you, and maybe I'm gonna uh, fight with you about it, and maybe not. So that's your first level. That is, you have a, a tax, you take a tax position on your tax return, you say, the price is, the price is $10. The service looks, can look at that or not look at that. So just take all your returns. Are they going to look at it or not? That's the first cut, right? So you might just get away with it. They don't even look at it. And then they look at it and say, well, I don't agree with your price. Let's have a fight about this price. GlaxoSmithKline in, in Canada was a big, big case. Went to the Supreme Court fighting about what you should look at when you're trying to find, decide what that price is. They sent it back down to the tax court. You know, it's all kinds of evidence-based, and we're just fighting. It's like he said, she said, he said, she said. What should we include? What should we not? Oh, nobody knows. It becomes a battle that eventually gets settled behind the closed door where we can't see it. So we actually don't know what the outcome of this landmark case in Canada is because it was just decided in negotiation with the service after the court failed to, dis to decide the, the answer. So you say, okay, well, the next guy that comes along, what's the law? What's the law for transfer pricing? What's the rule? Well, we don't have that case. We can't look at it. We don't have that common law. So we have, again, still a standard. I'm simplifying, obviously, because that case involved a predecessor law. 
We don't have a standard. We have, uh, we have a standard which we have not fully fleshed out, and we're still groping around in the dark to find out what the right price is. Uh, and in the meantime, what do you think people do? Do you think they're you know, conservative and pick prices that you know, won't subject them to review? I beg you to read the financial statements of any public company, and you will see they are not conservative, because they have enormous lines telling you that you know we have fights with the service all the time about our transfer pricing. In fact, it's something that people monitor. Like who's in a who's in that's called in the ring. It's a it's a it's a constantly updated service that tells you who's in a transfer dispute dispute with who. It's the number one litigated issue. It is the number one issue that is dealt with in tax treaties, which we'll never see. We will never see that because it's behind closed doors. It's a diplomatic. So what's the law of transfer pricing? It's Beyond me, I can't tell you what it is. I don't know. I can tell you what the statute tells you and what the regulations say, but I cannot tell you what the practice is. I cannot tell you, and no one else will tell you. The OECD knows they're not telling. So you could say it's a GAR problem, but we'll never get there, I don't think, for the most part. Didn't really answer your question, but we'll talk. <laughs> we'll talk about it. That gives me a little exercise because I think this guy who talks about it's the way of the world, he's right. This is, a, this, is a, this is a hyper technical way of the world and you start talking about transfer pricing and you know what your audience does? <laughs> Me go for the kids in the room. My eyes glaze over. And it's not interesting. <laughs> but to stop the transfer price. But it's the critical issue, the reason that all the profits are there and not here. You know, technically. So you would think we would want to solve this. You would think, and the OECD is, is uh, engaged in a project in which they're pretending that they do want to solve it right now, <laughs> but they don't. I think, I, you know, I'll, I'll put some money on that for you if you like, <laughs> but I, yeah, they don't. Okay. Do we have, we have time for one more question, and, right? One more? Or are you going to cut me off? Uh, I, saw, I saw another I did, so did. I did, yeah. over there. Yeah. It might, she, might, she may have just given up and left the room, I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. Right there. And I'll just keep like all 30 seconds an hour. <laughs> no matter what I think I'll just say, I won't say it. <laughs> One word is yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, no. It depends. <laughs> You're to retain me. Sort of. Something like that. If, if you have a quick second, um, I just wanted to follow up on your comment about the OECD and them looking into or, or kind of looking into um, this whole thing. But so uh, high tax countries like Canada and the UK, and you talk about Starbucks. Um, like, what is the incentive anymore to be in the OCD if you have countries like Holland and Switzerland that are giving massive multinational tax breaks um, to companies like Starbucks and Glencore um, to, to shift their profits over there? I mean, the whole point is supposed to be for, I guess, foreign investment, um, but also for tax fairness. But so how can you have within the OECD um, just such a, such a difference in tax rates between member countries? I think the answer to be really blunt about it is that there is no country in the OECD that is not a tax haven in some ways for all the other countries. So we are a tax haven. We are a tax haven. We are certainly a very friendly jurisdiction. Did you see Burger King's acquisition of Tim Hortons? Do you know why they did that? Because we're going to tax them less than the U.S. is. Beggar thy neighbor is the main driving principle of the OECD. So if you're into that game, you should be in the OECD so at least you can, you know, see what everybody else is doing before they do it. It's kind of like first mover privileges. You know what's going to happen. You go home and quick change the law before the next guy does and, you know, reap the profits. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world uh, out there. <laughs> I was short and sweet. There you go. You got it. Well, on behalf of everybody here, it's my privilege to thank Professor Christians for uh, giving us a very insightful talk and leaving us with a fair amount to think about, both in terms of how we enforce human rights in non-traditional ways, because there's very little mention of the traditional human rights ways of doing things, but a very fulsome discussion of some of the ways that at least we think we can uh, enforce human rights, or may be able to enforce human rights, if we change some of the non-traditional ways that we do things. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And Here's a small token of our appreciation. Oh, that's, uh, that's super kind. Thank you.